So today we're going to talk about uh, playback sources. Uh, there's a lot that goes into playback, so today is going to be mostly focused on cue lists. Uh, the next webinar is going to be focusing on scenes and a couple of other functions of playback, but this one is going to be mostly focused on cues and cue lists. Um, and yeah, that's kind of my house rules. Uh, once again, you know, we are in lockdown in Austin, Texas because of the coronavirus. So if you hear uh, dogs barking, cats meowing, or dump trucks, my neighbor's currently moving out of his house and throwing away a bunch of stuff. Uh, so if you hear any of that stuff, just have to excuse it. Uh, without anything else I have to say, Megan, do you have anything you want to talk about before we get started? Let's jump right in and start talking about recording and playing back some cues. Uh, we've done all this wonderful work to get programming going where we can select fixtures, make palettes, all that kind of stuff. Now it's time to glue it all together and get some cues actually recorded. Um, so we actually already have some cues recorded here on faders one through seven, just because those are um, kind of like our test faders. So if we wanted to record the, a brand new cue list on fader 10, the easiest way to record a cue is just recording it directly to a list on a master. Um, so let's go ahead and open the group directory and the programmer or yeah. Cool. So we're going to record in this first queue. We're going to make it super simple where we turn some lights on. So we're going to select the solo spot 2000s, bring those guys to full. And then record that onto fader 10. So to record that onto fader 10, you just press record and then you press choose on the fader you want it to. So we're going to hit record and then Noah's going to press choose on fader 10. And that just made a whole new list on fader 10 and gave us a queue one as well. Um, now, if we wanted to record a second queue, we're going to basically repeat the same thing. So we're going to make actually for our second queue, we're going to add in color here um, and we're going to make them red. I'll let Noah choose his method of color mixing for this one. All right, cool. So we're going to record this as queue two. So hit record and then press choose again on that fa same fader. And that has record and that has recorded our two cues. Um, now, what will happen though is because we have information in our programmer, our programmer, since it's the active editor, um, it's always going to take precedence over playback. So we're going to go ahead and hit clear first to actually play back these cues. Cool. Now that we hit clear, um, to to go back the cue list, we can actually make sure we bring the fader up to hundred percent. Um, this by default is going to scale your intensity in the cues. And then you can hit that go button right above the fader. And that's going to go the first cue. Now, what since this master is the chosen master, I think Noah hit the choose button on it um, on fader 10. Then, and we know that's the chosen master because it has that blue LED lit up. We can actually also ex go the cue list by hitting the, the big play button that's a little bit cut off. Um, by the command line that's okay well just know that button right below that pause key is the main main uh play button and that affects the chosen master so now we can go in between those two cues uh, if you wanted to record a cue so like actually we need to add in position into in between q1 and q2 um so we're going to make it a separate queue of q to do this we can actually specify what queue number we want to record um, so let's hit one through nine, enter. And then tilt them downstage for me. Great. And now we're going to record this as Q 1.5. So we just put position information in. So we're going to hit record. 1.5. And then enter. I didn't have to specify what list or what fader I wanted to record to because I just wanted to record onto the chosen master here. Um, so now we're going to hit clear. Great. Um, now hit go for me, Noah. And that's going to go back to the beginning of the queue list. Hit go again. That goes Q 1.5. And then go one last time goes Q 2. And that's how we can start recording cue lists and how you can specify what cue you want to record on that chosen master. 
Now, once you have a queue list going, you probably also want to, you know, turn it off at some point. Um, so to do that, that's what Hog calls releasing. So to release the master, um, after it's the chosen master, you hit the release button, and that's going to release whatever the chosen master is. Cool, and that basically turned it off. Um, there's also one other nifty way to record a queue, and that is just recording a queue. You can specify once you have the information in your programmer what master you want to record it to. So if we wanted the LED bars to be on in like a blue in the back on fader number eight, we can do that. So 401 through at full, make them blue. And then to record this to fader eight in Q1, we can hit record eight slash one and then enter. And so by saying eight slash one, we're saying record to master eight, whatever list is on master eight and into list and into Q1. Uh, you can also say specifically at that point, what list you want also. So you could have said record list eight slash one, and that would have gone into list eight Q1. Uh, and that's what I have for recording and playing back cues. So Noah's going to talk a little bit about tracking and why we saw that position information go into Q2. Right. So tracking is kind of a fun little topic. Uh, basically, the rule for tracking is lights don't do anything unless they're told to do otherwise. So if we kind of look at that cue list that we recorded a second ago, I'm going to double tap it. So if I double tap either the, the choose key to open up the chosen master window, or I can actually double tap on the screen here where my mouse is, that'll open up this master window. Allow us to just kind of see what is happening uh, for our queues. So you see that we have three queues here. We have Q1, 1.5, and Q2. Uh, the way tracking works is data will continue to fall through queues until they receive different data. Uh, so let's go ahead and go back to queue number one here. So I'll press play until we're back into queue number one. So currently the data in this queue is just basically lights. They're at full. They're technically they're aiming straight down, but that data is actually not in the queue. The only true data that's in that queue is just intensity values. Press play. When our lights move forward. That's what we recorded into the second queue. We haven't recorded color or anything else yet. And then we press play again. And you'll see that in this queue, our lights are uh, red, but the position values from Q1.5, uh, our second queue really, and then the intensity values from Q1 are still tracking through our queue list. So I'm just gonna go ahead and record a couple more things to this queue list. Uh, so the next thing I'm gonna record is, I'm gonna actually release it. So I'm gonna release that queue list. And I'm gonna say one through nine, and then let's we'll say at full. And then I'm going to put it in a different color. So we'll do, we'll do blue. Now, note how right now, as it stands in my programmer, uh, the only information is intensity and color values. Okay, there's not any position values. I'm going to record this as I'm seeing it on stage right now to this cue list. So I'll hit record. Press the choose key on number 10, which is the handy way to record it as the next queue on that queue list. And I'll press clear. And we're going to take a look at what our queue list looks like now. So I'll press play. I'll go back to Q1 here. So in Q1, once again, unchanged, lights are on and down. Q2, our lights move forward. Q3, our lights change colors. And then Q4, our lights are in this bluish purple color except the uh, position is aiming out towards us. And so that is basically the concept of tracking. So uh, the position values from a previous queue are tracking down through the queue list. Uh, this is useful for several things. Uh, it's mainly useful for when you're dealing with really large queue lists and you need to make an update to several queues at once. You can just update it uh, in one queue and let the data track through. Uh, there's a concept called block queues uh, that is used a lot in programming where basically you can take a uh, a queue full of hard data. Basically, there's hard values for every single parameter, every single fixture. And what that does is essentially stop tracking the values. There's a few ways to work around tracking. So for example, if you wanted to have a queue uh, that uh, might be known as like queue only on another console, uh, you can record a queue that way as well. 
So let's kind of talk about how to do that. So I will, once again, I'm going to uh, release this queue list. And let's just say that we wanted to have a queue that was queue only, a queue that uh, is on its own, but doesn't affect tracking in a queue list. So we'll just build something in the programmer. So I'm gonna close that window. Go ahead and select the spots again, tell them to go to full. And you know what, let's put them in, let's put them in position. Let's put them in, I don't know, that position. And we'll make them go yellow. Yellow's an ugly color. Uh, and so this is where we can uh, use our record toolbar to sort of modify this queue list a bit. So I'm gonna reopen that master window and I wanna record a queue, queue only essentially, uh, between Q2 and Q3. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit record. And when I hit record, the record toolbar pops up, which is this little toolbar at the bottom of the screen. We talked about this a lot in the last video. Uh, but one of the things that we didn't talk about in the last video, because it deals with playback, is track forward and track backwards. So track forward is enabled by default. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, disable it. And then now that I've specified record, I'm going to choose where I want to record it to. And in this case, I'm going to record it to uh, 2.5. So that assumes Q2.5. Hit enter. And then I'm also going to clear out my program. And I'll talk about why that's important in a minute. So I've cleared out my programmer. Now let's take a look at the queue list. So we press play. So here we are in Q1. Looks exactly how we had it. Q1.5 unchanged. Q2, we have our color change. And Q2.5, we've crossfaded into that, uh, that look I just created. And then Q3, note how the values for position and color in Q2 are actually tracking through versus Q2.5. So what the console did is actually kind of smart. It basically says, insert something here, but don't break the tracking between Q2 and Q3. So it actually just kind of put in hard values in three so that those values would continue to carry through. That's a very useful tool uh, if you like that functionality. Uh, if you don't like tracking, you can disable it. Uh, I do recommend that you really work with it if you're not familiar with it. Um, so what is a hard value? So if you ever want to know what a hard value is, you can open up a queue to take a look at it. So in your master window, let me just switch this over a little longer so we can see. Uh, in your master window, there's a button that says view queue. I'll go ahead and press play so we're back into Q1 here. I'm going to hit view queue. And in this window, you can see those hard values. So you can see that in this queue, the only data right now is 100% intensity and everything else is blank. So there's not any data there. We could add data in later, but all of this data here that is currently blank and doesn't have anything, that means that other values could track through if we would record uh, something above this queue. So like a queue uh, 0 0.1 or anything, you know, that would be higher up the list. You can also punch through your cues here. So I'm gonna hit the next button, which is the top of this window. And then you can see what is actually tracking. So in this queue, when we recorded it, uh, we only included position information. So we can see those degree values for position for pan and tilt uh, in this queue. But we can also see that intensity values, this little light gray value here, those are the values that are tracking through. Hit next again, same thing. You can see intensity and position are tracking and color is uh, the hard value in this uh, this queue. Hit next, once again, position change, color change. Those are hard values, intensity and the color slot actually right here, this information is what is tracking through. So you can find out what your data is uh, in each of these queues really easily just by opening it up. Uh, and once again, this is an active editor, which is something we talked about in the last video, but you can also update queues uh, from this window as well. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out for now. Uh, there's also a really handy tool called state. And so basically what state is, is it just grabs what the fixture is doing. It's kind of like touch. If for those of you familiar with what touch is on the console already. So uh, an example of state, I'll show you here. Uh, let's see, can we find a good way to kind of explain this here? Uh, so in this queue, Q3 right now, I'm going to view it. Uh, as it stands, the only actual true values of this queue are position, 
and color values. Okay, those are the only values that actually truly uh, are in the queue. They're the hard values. If I were to take this queue and I were to copy it to another place, the only information that I would normally copy would just be those hard values. So that actually means that like the intensity information would not get carried over anything like that. So uh, whenever you do a copy to command, there is a state key. So if you say state, it'll copy that information over. Uh, this is also useful for when you've got like multiple queue lists together. Uh, so if I have like multiple queue lists, so push another fader up here. This is something that was just built into uh, the show file already. If I have multiple bits of information going on right now, I could copy uh, the state of the fixtures over depending on uh, taking data from all different queue lists and all different queues. Uh, so once again, you hit record and there's the state function. Uh, and then there's also, once again, if you copy something, you can hit copy and choose state. Um, so yeah, let's take a quick look at any of the questions. If anyone has anyone, any questions about that real quick. Uh, Megan, do you have anything else you wanted to point out? Um, not with tracking, no. I was going to answer Rick's question out loud. I know I typed in the of answer, course. but um, so Rick asked, is there any advantage to recording Q number dot five versus the next whole number? Um, the dot five just allows you to place it in somewhere. So like because so what I was trying to achieve was getting the position Q that Q1.5 before the color Q Q2. So if I would have just recorded as the next whole number, it would have recorded the very end of that Q list. Whereas Q saying record Q1.5, that actually records it to Q that actually puts it in between Q1 and Q2. Um, so that just makes it a little bit easier that way for me to understand for uh, it just allows me to place my cues where I want them. Yeah, there's also uh, so there's a read number function in the console. So if you mm -hmm. look at this, this window, there's a read number button and it's just going to read number all your cues to be a whole number they can fit. Uh, so that's really handy. I actually use point cues to actually tell me what's in that queue. Uh, so a lot of times if a queue is like a blackout queue, I'll make it uh, a number and then point nine. Uh, which is just a good way that if I ever see point 0.9 anywhere in my queue list, I know it's going to black out all my lights. Uh, if I'm never having a queue that's like a marked queue, or like a manual marked queue or a queue uh, that is preparing lights for something to happen, I'll usually make it like a point 0.1 uh, instead of it being point 0.5. So uh, you can kind of use that numbering scheme to your advantage to kind of not necessarily label your queues, but kind of know what exactly the queue is. Uh, just from using that sort of uh, number scheme. I also do, like I do a lot of dance shows. And so a lot of times like my first number will be 101 to 121 or something like that. And then the next one will be 201. I'll just skip all the numbers in between. That way I know that the X, X01 or, you know, is the first of that number essentially. So just kind of lab labeling your cues is really handy in that regard. Uh, and you can label them. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was just, no, you talk about labeling real quick and then I'll say how I do my queue numbering. Yeah, so you can you can also label queues. So you just highlight a queue that you want to label, you double click it where you press the set key uh, and that'll bring up a little window and you can call it, you know, whatever you want. Uh, you can also color code your queues. Uh, something, that, something that not a lot of people know, but if you right click and hit show color, you can actually put in uh, color values to your queues if you wanted to. Cool. So to get that once again, you right click and hit show. You have to hide show it first. Color. Yeah. yeah, you have to hide it. Hide color and then you show. Right click and show. Color. Uh, can we color code cues without a mouse? I believe that's one of the ones that we actually need a mouse for. Yeah, so most don't know of the time. set can... works for it. I don't I have, a, I have a console over here. I don't think you can use pig set in this regard. No, um, because you have to be on the header. The mount, the it doesn't track at that point. Yeah, so normally if you want to right click something, you can hit uh, pig and set in that of right click. But that's one of those. There's a few places in my console where you can't do it, and that's one of them. Okay. Um, I don't actually use dot numbers a lot in my queue numbering. Um, because I do a lot more theater based stuff. It's a lot easier for my 
for my stage manager to call whole numbers. So I actually number in 5, 10, 15, 20. So in five increments. So when I need to add in Q numbers or add in Qs, I can actually just add in a whole number instead of a dotted number. Again, it's just a little bit easier to call that way. Um, but that's just my opinion on Q numbers. Lots of people use the dotted numbers. I mean, Noah's is also valid because then you can see which ones you have. Like our, we can quickly glance and be like, oh, cool, I'm about to hit a blackout. Like that kind of deal. Um, but that's how I do my Q numbers, is with whole numbers as much as possible. Uh, Josh asks, is there a way to update multiple queues at once opposed to just updating the one queue that is tracking through? Yeah, so you put the information in your programmer that you want to add, and then you say record queue uh, number through queue number. So if you wanted to have queues, say, 11 to 15, have a you know a red mix color or something like that, you would put that information in your programmer, record queue 11 through Q15 enter. Uh, you do need to have that master chosen or you need to specify what Q list first. We haven't quite talked about what Q lists are in this window yet. Uh, or haven't really taken a big look at them, but there are you know multiple Q lists essentially. Cool. Um, and I believe we can also merge through multiple queues as well, which we're about to talk about. Um, so with that being said, since we just got asked an update question, let's actually talk about updating some queues and how we're going to update queues. Um, cool. So the easiest way to update queue is to make, like if you want to make sure the update's going to take and all that kind of stuff, is to actually open the queue itself. So if we wanted queue 1.5 to be a different position now, we can say, Q, since this is still the chosen master, um, we can say queue. 1.5 open and that's going to open the active editor kind of like how noah just got us to see what the tracked values were um and since this is the active editor we can actually just go in and start changing cues and you, you can tell in a couple of ways that this is the active editor um down here at the bottom of the command next to the command line there will be the list number and the queue number that you currently have open showing you that you're the active editor and usually, or by default, you get dumped into blind. So blind is usually turned on when you open an editor. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and turn off blind. And then we can make some edits now. So can we just change their position somewhere drastic? That sure. is <laughs> the most descriptive location I can tell you. There you go, hopefully that's pretty drastic. There we go, straight out towards the audience. Great. Um, so now, once the queue is up, once the you have um, once you have values changed inside your queue list, inside your queue, you'll see at the top it says modified. It's very similar to exactly what we saw in the last video with editing palettes, actually. Uh, and then, so to finish, and now you're done updating, you hit the update button, and that's going to close the window, and your queue is now updated. Well, and because we're in Q3, we actually didn't get to see what it did. Um, so if we wanted to go to that, go to a Q specific to a Q number specifically, we can actually hit the go to button right next to the set, and we can type in what Q number we want to go to. So hit go to 1.5 enter, and that'll get us to Q 1.5. Cool. And now that put and now we've updated to that position. So that's one way we can edit palette. I mean, we can edit a queue. Another way is through the auto update window. Um, so hit go for me, Noah. Cool. I don't like that it's blue anymore now. Um, we're actually going to change this instead of blue. We're going to change it to be green. So let's select one through nine. Enter. Um, and then change it to green, your favorite method. There you go. Great. Um, and now that it's green, we can hit the update button. And by hitting the update button for a queue list or a scene that's currently going, it's going to open this auto update window um, that we just need to switch the scene real quick to see. Sorry, you can't see it because no. it's an extra window. Yeah. 
Um, so the auto update, how this this window gives you the option to, of course, op update um, queues. If you were using a palette, it would also give you the option to update a palette and the palette that was being used in the queue here. Um, it would also, it's also usually really good for up, for updating information that already exists. So because we were in a queue that changed the color, we just updated the color here. Um, if I was in a queue that changed position, I would just change the position here. That kind of deal is what I like to use the update button for. Um, there is this option here for track backwards. And what track backwards is going to do is allow us to actually change change this information in the first queue where the change happened. So we're going to go ahead and just update the color real quick um, and just hit OK. And then we're going to do see what track backwards will do in just a minute. So now, because we updated the color, and if we clear out the programmer, we should be able to see that it has now changed to green. And so now the fixtures are green because we updated. Um, now let's do something with the track backwards and see what that does. So let's let's actually put the fixtures at 50% intensity for me. Um, hit one through nine at five, enter. Great. And then hit update. And now check the box that says track backwards and then hit OK. I don't think we need to switch scenes for this one. Cool. So we got that updated. Um, now if we hit clear, our fixture should still stay 50% because we didn't specify intensities and cause tracking to break from Q2, Q1 to 2. Um, but if we go to Q1, we should still see that the fixtures are at 50%. Um, and if you QQ, Still perfect. Perfect. And we can see that they actually changed in Q1 50% because track backwards said, hey, make this change in the first Q that this change happened in. So intensity was decided was put in intensity information was added in Q1. So by hitting track backwards, it actually updated in Q1 instead of in Q3 where we said that for the change to happen. This is really useful when you don't know where that change was. So if you added a gobo into a, a queue list somewhere and then, you know, the director designer comes in and says, I don't like that one at all. And I want to make that change. You could just say update track backwards. And it's going to find wherever that last change of gobo was. It's also handy because if you had like position data and color data and all these different queues and you want to just update, it'll actually update to multiple places for you if you wanted to. So it'll find the update for position, update the position value there, update the value for gobo, update it there, color, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um, tra track backwards is usually great. It's usually a go-to of mine. Um, another thing with update is usually people want to do what's called update queue only. Um, people are very used to that button if you're coming from an EO standpoint. That way we only update what like that specific queue. We don't have it go forwards. And that kind of leads us a little bit back to that track forward button. Um, no, can you hit one through nine and hit at full for me? And then hit update. So when you hit update, you'll notice at the bottom there's a couple different buttons that actually line light up at the bottom of the screen. And one of them being track forward is turned on, which means if we make an update in this auto update window, track forward is going to say, "Great, this intensity is going to go through the rest of the queues." So to update queue only or only update this one specific queue, that's when you turn off track backwards. So if you turn off track forward. backwards, I mean track forward, I'm sorry, <sighs> which is right next to you, track backwards. Um, if you turn off track forward, it'll update this one specific queue. Cool. And that's that's really how the auto update window works and how you can utilize track forward, track backwards when updating window, when updating queues. Um, one other way to update queues is using the merge button, or if you're going to want to record over. Uh, record into it over the queue. You can also get that merge option. Um, so let's just make. Um, sorry, I'm trying to figure out what lights I want to add. Um, let's add the Unos in here. So let's do 401 or 301 through the pool. 
Um, tilt them a little bit downstage or towards the audience. Cool. And we're going to merge these into Q3 right now. Um, so to merge these into Q3, we'll hit the merge button. Then Q3, enter. Now, because I just said Q3, I didn't specify what list to go to. It goes to the chosen master. So it's going to that list that lives on fader 10, that list number eight there. Um, so if we clear out the programmer, we can see that great, the light unos aren't in there. So if we play through our cues until we get to Q3, we'll see that finally the unos get added in in that last queue. And that's how merge can be done. Uh, and then you can merge, so you, you can merge into multiple queues, merge Q3 plus two plus one, enter, or merge Q3 plus Q2 plus Q1, enter, and that should merge multiple queues together. I merge this information into multiple queues. Now, if you're utilizing tracking, which you should because the desk is tracking by default, in theory, you shouldn't have to merge these queues, these lights in, but there are cases where you'd want to merge into multiple queues at a time. Um, any questions about updating cues? So there's a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll start at. Uh, I'm going to take Bill's question here. Um, can you give some examples of how to arrange cues and stacks for band slash theater? Um, I'm hoping that means band versus theater. Uh, so I, I tell every programmer that I ever meet, you know, the best way to do something is the way that works best for you. Uh, so the way that I think is best might not always be the best thing for Megan or any other programmer out there. Uh, so I always say, you know, experiment and try to figure out what works best for you personally, uh, but also, you know, talk to other programmers whenever you can. Uh, so when I'm doing theater stuff, I try to just do everything in one queue stack. The only time when I don't is when I have like something that's kind of like extra that needs to be done like manually, like maybe a lightning strike or a fire scene or something that has to kind of have some sort of a manual operation. Uh, when I do dance, you know, I usually have it. Uh, there's a couple ways I do it, but usually uh, I actually have a queue list for each number specifically. Uh, so, you know, main reason for that is if the in dance shows, it's almost very common, at least the ones I work, that things get reorganized. Uh, so stuff in the first act gets moved to the third act and third act to the second and things get cut and things get added. Uh, so a lot of times I'll do one queue list per number. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll make a what's called a master queue list that will um, trigger other queue lists from that master queue list. Uh, that'll probably make more sense. We're going to talk about um, how to work with multiple pages and multiple wings. Uh, in, uh, we're also going to talk about comment macros in the next two videos. So that'll probably make more sense then. But uh, usually I tend to break it up. Uh, when I'm doing anything rock and roll live events related on the hog, I generally don't do a lot of cue lists. I usually do scenes, which we're going to talk about in the next video. Uh, but I save my cue lists for anything specifically mentioned in the writer. So anything that, you know, like they want to have a big specific walk in or walk out, that'll be a cue list. Uh, or if I have some sort of a very specific chase or set of events where I want to say flash left, flash right, flash center, and I want that to be uh, a sequence of cues, and I'll put that into a cue list. I generally use scenes, but you know that's just kind of how I break it up. Um, as I said, the, the the best way is always the one that works best for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I do my I do my cue list for th for. Um... I do my cue list for theater very linearly until I get an effect or anything that loops. Once I get an effect or anything that loops, that usually gets built into a separate cue list that I can trigger via comment macros, which we're going to talk about at the end of this video. Um, and triggering via comment macros, I mean, it just works a lot easier. It keeps, I'm usually not the board up whenever I'm the board up for theater. So uh, by triggering via comment macros, the board op just focuses on the one cue list on the chosen master and he just hits go or she just hits go whoever it is just hits go and it just plays through and they don't have to worry about it besides that 
Um, and like I said, I just my numbering is really the only thing that stays consistent between sh between cue lists. It just it, between shows. It just depends on what me or the designer wants. Usually, it's what the designer wants at the end of the day. Um, sometimes I get to decide like the sticking it into a separate cue list, but the designer will ultimately tell me what I what he wants from me. Um, when you, I had lost all of my, okay, so when you update a queue, are you able to disable tracking for that queue? So if you don't want it to carry it forward, yes, turn off track forwards, and that'll just not let anything track that you just updated with. Yeah, I really recommend that you, uh, if you're not familiar with tracking, you really should embrace it. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful tool once you understand why it's so wonderful. Uh, and there's a reason, you know, all major moving light consoles use it. Uh, I had a bit of a brain loss on what I was going to mention here. Uh, it, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm uh, sorry. I mean, no, no, you're good. I'm just going to try to maybe fill in. Tracking is also really useful because then you can set up your lights in the queue before if you need to, or you can count on that zoom always being in the same thing. Or once you start like dabbling with media servers or pixel mapping, which is its own type of media server, you could say, um, you don't have to worry about resetting that pixel map image library every single time. You just, you have that image library, that image folder, just in Q1, and then you can go through all the lit, all the, all the different folders. Whereas if you turned off tracking and for some reason you adjusted like a folder or something and it got taken out, that could actually partially mess up the show file going forward because you're not, you don't have that information anymore. Um, so you'll, I mean, I, I always say embrace tracking as much as possible. It's where the, it's where the industry is going, especially with all of this like pixel tape and all of these fixtures that have like 8 million channels. Like, I mean, I don't know if a lot of y'all are familiar with the DLHDs, but that whole fixture, that moving light projector can pretty much by itself take up a whole universe. Like that's a lot of parameters to keep track of and um, tracking helps take care of those parameters a lot. Uh, so you, you can disable it by default. So if you go into your preferences, I'm gonna close all the windows here. Uh, if you go into your preferences and then under recording, uh, you can disable track forward by default. So if you just don't like tracking for whatever reason, you can have it disabled so that when you uh, record or you update or you merge, it is in queue only mode essentially. So that can be done in your preferences window. Uh, actually, I don't want to apply that. So I'll keep that on. <laughs> just kidding. Tracking is your friend. Um, and then you can also make the queue list itself if you've recorded everything. And then you've decided you wanted to make the queue list queue only, you can go in and make that queue only on the queue list itself as well. Um, yeah. Uh, are the values still hard in the original queue? I'm guessing you're talking about with track backwards or track forwards. Um, yes, the original queue, the values will still stay hard in the original queue if you're t if you utilize track well. I need more clarification on what what you mean exactly there, rather than trying to guess what you mean. Uh, John. Uh, Guido asks, can you update other values than that were present in the queue? Uh, so that's something kind of funny about update. So update only updates information that was already there. Right. So if in this queue list we haven't touched any Gobo information, we update. It will not update Gobo information unless we specify otherwise. Uh, so that's kind of a reason where you might want to use merge versus update. Uh, so update's handy because it doesn't add in any extra uh, information that you didn't want there. So maybe you actually had some extra stuff in your programmer. Update will only update values that are already in that queue. Uh, whereas merge will just take everything from your programmer and just stack it into that queue. Um, do 
Josh asked, does it only track backwards to the la late last queue with change or through the whole queue list? It'll go back to the last queue with that change. So where it would track from originally. Uh, cool. And then when we update any queue, can we update the same time for our palette? So if you're using the update button and you use the palette in that queue, it'll ask if you want to update that palette at the same time. It'll be another checkbox, just like track backwards and the queue you want to update is as well. Just use um, so yes, you can. In the update box, you just check the box and it'll update the palettes. So I'm going to kind of continue on with our little outline here. Uh, so there's a couple other functions in playback that kind of need to be talked about. Uh, playback is this just huge thing that you could do so much with. Uh, so we're going to try to really hit the concepts here in this video. Uh, and then we have a whole other video in scenes, which is our next video, which is focusing on even more playback stuff. Uh, so a couple of things I want to talk about is um, assert and uh, latest takes precedence. Uh, before I talk about though, I do want to mention something that is a rule of the console. The rule is the programmer always has higher priority than playback. Okay, so there's multiple levels of priority in the console. Uh, so the programmer uh, editor essentially always has higher priority than playback. So what I mean by that, I'm going to select fixture number five, and I'm going to tell this fixture to go to red and now to the orange. So we got a little bit of contrast here. Okay. In the programmer window, the values are uh, for hue and saturation. Uh, and natural color slot, but basically the light is orange, okay? In the programmer, I don't have position values, I don't have intensity values, and I don't have values for any of the other fixtures currently. So if I go and I press play, and I'm gonna size this over just so it's over here, and open up this window so we can see both windows on the side here. You'll see that here I am in Q1, my middle light is still orange, but it can move in the queue, next queue, and all the other lights are doing their own thing. So what this means is anything that's in my programmer is uh, taking priority over anything that's going to happen in playback. Uh, so this can kind of get you in trouble if you're not careful with yourself. Uh, so do kind of keep that in mind. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a few ways to get around this. So if you wanted to keep the information in your programmer, but you want to see what your queue list looks like, that's where blind is really handy. So if you press the blind key, it aligns your programmer, prevents it from getting any kind of output, and then you can see what your queue list looks like. And then if you want to make any adjustments, because you made something intricate in your programmer, you can unblind, make the change wherever you want, and then update your queue or merge into your queue, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so do keep in mind that that is a bit of a rule in the console. The programmer always, every time, has higher priority than playback unless you press blind, or obviously if you press clear. So if you clear out your programmer, then there's something in your program, there's something for uh, it to override playback sources. Uh, the next thing... We should actually is, say the active editor. So if you have a queue open, that also overrides playback. So it's whatever is whatever editor is listed at the bottom of your right-hand display or at the bottom right of your single display where it says programmer right now, whatever that editor is will override your playback. Right, yep, sorry, if you also have an editor for anything open. Yeah. Um, I just so, wanted to make that clear also. Nope, you're very right. So the other thing we wanna talk about is this thing called LTP. So that stands for latest takes precedence. Once again, lights do whatever they're last told to do. So this is where I'm gonna get into making a whole nother queue list now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a queue list and I'll say one through nine. I'm going to say at full, and uh, I'll put them in some sort of a color. So maximize their saturation, and uh, I'll do a I'll do a color fan, something like this. Something that's very obvious, right? So in my programmer, as it stands right now, I have intensity and I have color information in the programmer. I'm going to record this as a whole new queue list onto master nine. So I'm going to hit record, and then I'm going to press the choose key on number nine. And because I still have information in my programmer right now, I want to clear that information out because I don't want to override my queue lists. So I'm press clear. And now I'm gonna also move my fader up. 
on fader number nine, uh, master number nine, and I'm gonna press play. So I've played that cue list and you can see that now uh, color has changed. Now the UNOs are still on and the solo spots are still in that position. The reason why is because these fixtures are getting their information from multiple playbacks, right? So currently the solo spots are getting their information from uh, master number nine's cue list, uh, but they're getting their uh, position information from master number 10, and the UNOs are getting their information from master number 10 as well. Uh, so if I wanted to reapply what is currently active on uh, number 10, that's where a cert comes in. So Press the choose key on 10, make sure it's chosen, which it already was. And I'll press the assert key and watch what happens. See how my lights transitioned back into the queue. So that's a way of basically reasserting, reapplying that queue back on the stage. Uh, once again, lights do whatever they're last told to do. So if I were to press play once again on number nine, the lights are now doing whatever they're last told to do, which is the information on queue list, or sorry, on master number nine. Um, so that's called LTP. I'm going to press uh, the choose key here on number 10. I'm going to keep pressing play. And you'll note that eventually what is on number 9 actually automatically gets released. Uh, and so that's a function called stomping. So uh, how do I know that it got released? There's a couple of ways that I can know this. We notice that the pause key is no longer lit up on master number 9. That's one way to know. But also on my uh, playback display, it's actually QS10, but now on master number nine, there's those four little dots. Hopefully you can see it there. That's another way for me to know that that master has been released. Uh, so stomping, what essentially that means is that if a uh, playback or QLIST essentially does everything to override another playback, that playback automatically gets released. Uh, so because this cue list on uh, number 10 had uh, color information and intensity information on it, it overrid all the information from number nine and it automatically got released. Whereas if I press play on number nine, it triggers, once again, now number nine is active. Number 10 is can't release because there's still position information in that cue list. So just something to kind of keep in mind if you're working with multiple cue lists, understanding why it's automatically releasing. There is a way that you can kind of get around that. Uh, so let's look at this behavior. So I'm going to press choose here and I'm going to release number 10. And you'll see here that the lights are aiming straight down. They're still in that color, but they don't have that position. Uh, and then if I press play, it releases uh, what was on nine. But if I release 10, you'll note that my lights go to black. Uh, so once again, I completely stomped out what was on master number nine. So now I hit release and all of a sudden my lights are black. So there is a function in the console called persist on override. And so this counteracts that behavior I just mentioned. So uh, there's a few ways to enable it. So the easiest way is I'm on double tap choose on this master. I'm going to go into options. And then we're going to talk about this window in a bit, but I'm going to enable what's called persist on override. And this is specific to this queue list only. I'm going to close it. And then once again, I'm going to press play on master nine. Press play on master 10 here. And then watch what happens here when I press release on 10. My lights actually fell back to master number nine. So if you are busking or punting a show, uh, or basically you just, I really uh, recommend that everyone enables this for their stuff, but basically it prevents you from kind of going to black when you release. Basically, if something is overridden and you release that thing that's overridden, it goes back to whatever it was doing previously. It's kind of like going backwards LTP. So just a couple of different uh, pieces of terminology I wanted to mention bringing up about the console. Um, so once again, that's persist on override. Uh, we'll talk about that in, Maybe later on in this video, uh, a little more in depth, but also in the next video, we're definitely going to be talking about it when we talk about scenes. Um, so any, any questions about how to bring a cue list up, how to release it, uh, playback priority, anything like that? Noah, why don't you take this one from Noah? <laughs> hey, Noah. Parameters cause the stomp. Uh, what parameters cause the stomp? So, it's a copy. 
So in Q list, uh, on the Q list number nine, let's take a look at the values here. So UQ, we have intensity and we have color, okay? Uh, in this Q list on number 10, there are, once again, intensity and color values throughout this Q list. So those would completely stomp out uh, the values from uh, what's on master number nine. That makes sense. Hopefully, it makes sense. He also further clarified some lists stomp out and some don't. Usually, that's because some lists don't have. Some lists have one extra parameter than what the other list doesn't. So, like okay. if my list has position and intensity, but the other list only has position, then the second list cannot stomp out the first list. Because we're missing here, information to stomp out. Here we are on this Q list. We've activated it. There's some position values on stage. If I press choose on number nine, no matter what I do on this Q list for color and intensity, technically, uh, it cannot stomp out 10 because it hasn't taken over that position value. So 10 is still going to be active. Uh, there are a few ways if you don't want that behavior. So if you didn't want 10 to carry over, there are a few options that you can enable, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but the, basically the general premise, right? There's still information in the other queue list. It doesn't get stomped out. Awesome. It says gotcha. Great. Um, any other questions about all that fun stuff? I, I know there's some back in there about merging and copying and we're going to talk we'll probably hit those in the actual q a section because believe me there's still a lot more info that we want to cover yeah this might be a long this might be a longer video <laughs> yeah all right guys so we're gonna uh, keep a lot that goes into playback oh, Go there definitely is and some of it we might just be like okay we'll do that next week with scenes um but with that being said let's talk about timing um well, actually, before that, I need an empty fader. No, oh, can you delete a fader? Or... Yeah. How do you cool. do that? Great. Um. So to delete a so what Noah's doing to delete a fader, he's just holding down to holding down delete and hitting choose on his faders. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit later on. But if you wanted to remove a mass, remove a list from a master, you just hold down delete and hit choose on that master, and it's going to remove it from the master. Um. So Noah, why don't you do me a favor real quick and hit one through nine. Eh, let's not do one through nine. We've been doing a lot of one through nine. Uh, let's do more of the LED bar. So 401 through at full. And can you get me like a queue with a different, with like red, the next queue with green and the next queue with blue on one yeah, list? Just, uh, just regular time values? Yeah, yeah, just defaults for now. Okay, I'm going to put it on one. Put it wherever you want, your heart desires. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You do. You're the programmer. You get to decide where it goes. I'm just going to tell you what the lights do. <laughs> That's usually how it is anyways. <laughs> and I'll do the light. Cool. And I'll press it there. Great. And then double tap choose on that fader as well for me. Awesome. Um. So as we hit go through this queue list, we'll see that the crop that the queue list itself is gonna all the queues are gonna crossfade um, in two seconds. So that's just the default timing for the queue. Um, each queue has three main timing values. You have your fade time, your delay time, and your wait time. Um, so the first one that I like to talk about is your fade time because that's the most obvious to talk about. So how long does it get to, to how long does it take for the crossfade to actually happen? So if Noah hits go, go right now, we'll see it takes two seconds for the lights to come on and the queue to change color. He hits go again. It's going to take two seconds again and go again, and it'll take two seconds again. Um, now, if we wanted to change the fade time just globally for the queue, um, we can actually change that from this queue list window. So no, let's just change all the queues at one time. So he's going to click and drag on all those fade cells and then hit set. Just like in any spreadsheet in Hog or most spreadsheets in Hog, when you press set, you can change the text. 
and we're going to say um, five seconds, so five enter. And now hit go, and it'll take five seconds to get, get through. It's perfect. And now we'll see it takes five seconds to get from Q1 to two, two to three, three to four. And um, I think it's WebEx that doesn't necessarily like the changes that much, um, but that would be actually a smooth crossfade. Um, now, if we wanted these to snap, then of course we can change the fade time to zero seconds in the exact same way. Just click and drag, hit set, zero, enter. And that gets us changed that way. Um, what's also cool is you can specify from the command line if you wanted to change your fade time. Um, just like we were changing the fade time the other day in the programmer, we just specify what queue number we want the fade time to change, um, time, and then the time we want it to take. So I'm going to say Q3, Q3 time, so time once is fade, um, three enter. We're going to give it three seconds. And so again, because it's the chosen master, we didn't have to specify what list we were talking about. We were able to just say Q3 time three enter. And that changed our fade time. So if Noah hits go, we're going to snap to that blue. And now if he hits goes, if he hits go again, it's going to do a crossfade for three seconds. And that's really how the fade time works. Um, delay time. Now we're going to talk about that delay time. That delay time is how long after you press go does the queue start executing the fade time, how, or how long after you press go does the queue start executing. So if we say on Q2, let's put a delay time of three seconds this time. So we'll just tap on the delay cell, hit set, three, enter. Now if we go to Q1, and then go, it's not going to do anything for three seconds. Once three seconds is done, then it makes that snap change. Um, so the delay time can be useful. Remember, last in the last video, we talked about fanning our delay time. Um, so let's actually edit Q4 to have a fan delay time. Um, so can we open Q4? So Q4. We're going to do this by opening the editor. And then because they're already selected, we're just going to hit time, time, zero through two, enter. So by hitting time, time, that means we're going to specify the delay time. Um, and then we said the beginning of our fixture selection is going to start at zero and the end we're going to fan through two seconds. So now we're going to hit update. Great. And then hit go to go Q3. And then we hit go again. And it's going to fan out our delay time. Um, and that's how fade and delay can work together. Um, I did see a question in the chat in the Q and A that says, "Does the fade time start after the delay ends?" Yes, it does. So, so the delay time is how how long after you press go for that cue until the fade actually starts happening, until that crossfade starts happening. Um, so, if we were to put a two second fit delay time on Q three, can you do, do that for me, Noah? Two second. Sorry, say that again. Yeah, two seconds on Q three. On delay or fade? Uh, delay. Sorry, that's my call three. That's okay. Cool. Um, and if we go back to Q2, we're gonna have to wait for that delay, of course, of three seconds. That's gonna be a snap to Q2. Now, when we hit go this time, it's gonna count down those three seconds for the delay. And then you have a three second fade time. So then we'll see the cross fade actually happen. It's not just a snap like Q2's was. So hopefully that, the, yes, the fade time does start after the delay ends. Cool. Um, and finally, so that's your fade time, that's your delay time, and then you have your wait time. So that's the, really the last cue, the last timing that I want to talk about. And your wait time is going to be used to automatically trigger cues. So how long after the previous cue starts does the current cue wait to actually go? So if we want um, can we set all the delay times actually back to zero seconds for me? Yep. 
Awesome. Um, and go ahead and set the fade times back to two seconds. Yep. Awesome. Um, if we want the wait time to on, uh, if we want the Q two to just uh, to go three seconds after Q one is after Q one, then we can click on the wait cell, hit set, um, type in three, and hit enter. And so now we've given that a default of wait time. Um, so now when we go on, when we press go on Q1, Q2 will automatically follow for three seconds. So as soon as you hit go, that's when that wait time starts counting down. So the go on Q1 triggers the wait time to start counting to trigger Q2. Um, there are also some other wait time options to to talk about in here. Um, let's click on, yep, click set, and then so there you have halt, and that just gets rid of the gets rid of the time in the wait cell. Um, same thing as hitting set and then backing out and getting rid of all the values and hitting enter, and then you have follow. So follow is going to say is going to trigger this queue to go as soon as the queue is before its fade time is done. Um, so go ahead and hit follow for me. And then enter. Um, now if we go to Q1, we'll see that once Q1 is done, then Q2 gets triggered. It's not going to wait any time. So if you just need the following Q to be triggered automatically after it's done, then that's when you use follow. You can also do a follow plus five, or a follow plus six um, if you wanted to increase that follow time. That way it's waiting that um, five seconds after Q1 has actually finished crossfading. Um, so a standard wait time starts the cross, starts the countdown when you hit go on the previous Q. A follow waits to actually go till the Q has completed uh, the crossfade. So go ahead and click hit set again. Then you have time code, and time code is going to say uh, is going to allow you to put hours, minutes, seconds. So you can actually, if you have time code specified in the desk, you can type in what the hours, minutes, seconds, or frame is to trigger this queue. Uh, manual is used in conjunction with time code. If you have a manual, um, if you have a queue list that's time coded, manual will allow you to hit to for the board op to actually hit go. It pauses the queue list until you hit go or the board op hits go. Um, and then you have clock and clock it allows you to set time of day triggers. So you can say every Monday through Friday, I want this queue list to go every Monday through Tuesday. And then every Wednesday, I want this queue list to go. So you can say specifically what you want to do. Um, and that's really the wait time cells. It's really just how timing works for the queue, for the queue, for each queue, the three main times for each queue. Um, I see questions are coming in about timing. So we can do that before we talk about paths. Uh, Noah, do you want to talk about in and out times? Uh, yeah, it's time number slash number, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I, I don't use often. them very often. I will specify in the queue what I want specifically. So I don't. I do. I do mine a little differently just because of how my brain works. Uh, but yeah, so you can um, uh, time in a number and slash another number. Uh, I'd have to look it up just because I, once again, my brain doesn't work that way. Uh, I do actual cues for ins and outs personally, uh, mm -hmm. but you can do that. Uh, it's somewhere. It's somewhere in our manual. But I believe it's the right syntax is like Guido, Guido, Guido. Sorry, names are really hard for me. Um, says so it's the in number slash the out number. Um, so I believe it's whatever cues are, whatever values are becoming, are getting higher takes the in number. I could be wrong though. Yeah, yeah. So values going up intensity take the first number. Values going down intensity take the lower number. Mm -hmm. Um. Can you do a follow minus time? Um, no, you cannot do a follow minus time, but you can specify a wait time. So like if I wanted Q2 to be one second 
before Q1 is over, then I can just take, I mean, I can do math. So two minus one, and that would start it. Um, so that would just be a wait time of one, um, but we can't do a follow minus the time. I really like the follow plus times whenever I'm doing marking. So I give the queue list, I give the queue enough time to mark. And then I, and then I do that follow. Um, how do we change the default fade time, Noah? Yeah, so a couple ways you can do it. Um, so in your options, uh, oops, just kidding. Uh, do, 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 do. This. Preferences under timing. So in your preferences window timing, you can specify your default fade time per kind if you want, um, or you just have it be global. So if you want it to be, say, five seconds, anything you do from now on will be a five second default time. Set that back to zero. So in your preferences. Um, can we do part cues? So, yeah, you make you make point cues basically. Yeah, I was, I, I always just do point cues for them. So I like no, I know EOS has like a specifically part cue button, or they did at one point. Um, but for on Hog, I just do like Q one dot one or one dot two, and have it and have it auto follow itself out as it needs to. You can trigger multiple queues on the queue list at the same time as long as they don't counteract each other's data, right? Because mm -hmm. that queue one point one is your fixtures at full, the next one your fixtures are at fifty, your next one's your fixtures at twenty five. Those are counteract each other. But if you had Q one point one is position, Q one point two is color, Q one point three is gobo or something like that, they don't counteract each other. Then you can, they can be triggered at once. Um, or I delay out my times, my my fixtures in the queue itself. If I don't do parts, if I don't do dots, um, where I can do like great my intensity, so I can say great. Uh, I can just say my fixtures intensity is delayed by one second, whereas my position is delayed by two seconds, and my color is delayed by one point five. That way they stagger in, side just that one queue specifically. Um, but you can also do that with your delay times as well. Will we go over marking cues? We probably should go over marking cues. Um, I don't know. Do you mean to take it? Yeah, go ahead. Talk about marking cues. Cool. So I'm going to just really solve play back here. So what is a mark queue? Mark queue is basically like a read and black queue. So uh, really simple. Put it in a position, put it in our lead singer, and we put in a Gobo of some sort, turn down that intensity so we can see a little better, and we'll also just do some color. And you guys can't see it, but now you can. Uh, so there we go, we've got this look on stage. Uh, record that as a cue, so I'll hit record, and I'll put it as cue, put it onto master mine here. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, take my fixtures, so I'm going to go to zero, so at zero, enter, like we're doing like a blackout or something. Record that onto that master again. So I hit record, choose that master, and then uh, tell my fixtures come back to full again. Do a new gobo, do you know drum solo, and uh, take our lights to just do white. That's fun. So here we are, whole new gobo, whole new color, whole new position. Record that onto twelve, and let's take a look at what that looks like. So I'm going to press clear, I'm going to double tap choose in the master so we can bring up that window. And play Q1. Fader's not up, that's always important. So here's Q1, the lights go out. And then watch what happens when I press play. See how my lights cross faded from, from white or from red to white from that downstage position into the uh, drummer. And then at the very, very beginning of the queue, you might have caught it. Uh, depending on how well WebEx is handling uh, this, is you would see that snap of the gobo as well. 
So that's where a mark queue is really handy. So basically, if lights are at zero, when you put a mark on that queue, it takes the, anything that's not an intensity parameter and prepares it for the next queue. So that's in the mark column. So I'm going to double tap mark here, uh, and there's a window that comes up. It says fade. I'm just going to say fade. Uh, basically, uh, it it assumes that you want to follow the fade time of that queue to mark. Uh, the reason why is because lights are loud, and so it assumes that you want to slowly crossfade. Because a lot of times when you're doing this, uh, lights are off or they're black, so therefore you don't want to hear the the audio might be kind of quiet or you can hear the lights moving. So it assumes that you want to fade out. If you want it to be instantaneous, you can do that as well. Uh, so now we've done that. I'll press play back to queue one. So watch what happens. We're in this queue. We cross fade again to screen so you can see it. Uh, so here we are. We're in our queue. I press play. We fade out. Wait for it to mark a second. Give it about two seconds to mark. I press play. And this time my lights appear where they're supposed to be. So that's a mark queue. Uh, you can just have everything auto mark if you want. There's an option for that in your um, options window. Uh, mark time new queues. Uh, but that's what a mark is essentially. Cool. And with that said, Noah, why don't you lead us into chases? Yeah, chases. Let me bring my notes real quick. Cool. So uh, a chase is just a looping of uh, cues. So uh, there's a way that you can kind of do the same thing. Uh, so I'm going to take your list, Megan, that you had earlier. Yeah. So what you can do is you could do, say, a wait time of, you know, two seconds on that queue list. And if I press play at any point here, because I have a wait time for everything, it's just going to constantly loop, right? Because when it hits the bottom of my queue list, it's just going to go on to queue number one, so on and so forth. So this queue list is currently looping. Um, excuse me. So that is kind of one way to make a chase. It's not the official way to make a chase. There's an actual chase option. Uh, that's essentially what we're going to try to create. So uh, what is a chase? A chase is just, just a looping of cues. I'm going to just remove this here. Set, we'll do halt, enter. So it's a looping of cues. Uh, this is really handy when the effect engine can't quite get what it is that you're looking for specifically. So if you need a very specific set of steps, uh, you might want to use a chase uh, versus using, say, like the effect engine or using the pixel mapping engine. So uh, we'll make a chase. Let's do this. I'm going to press clear. Uh, also, I'm going to release all my playback. So I can do that by holding pig and pressing release. A little shortcut for that. And uh, Go ahead and open up the group directory here. And I'll open up the programmer as well, just so we can see all the programming. We'll do this. We'll do all soul spots at full. And we'll put them in the lead position. And then uh, let's also make them go red. Add a little color into this. So we'll say red. It's very orangey. There you go, red. Uh, so I'll record that onto my queue list. So I'll record, put that on the master two. Uh, put it in another position. Let's do the electric here. Do blue. Record, put that onto master two. Shoot it across the stage. Do white. No, let's not do white. Let's do. We'll do white. Do right. Record that onto there. So let's take a look at our cues and press clear. Double tap, choose, or double tap on that master. So once again, our first cue, push the fader up. Lights are on, singer red. We want to cross the stage to electric blue. We want to cross the stage to our uh, bassist uh, and white. So those are our, uh, essentially our uh, positions. So if I go into my options, and there's a function here called is a chase. So I'm going to say is a chase. I've got a couple of extra options here. Uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but now if I press play, so I can go really quickly here, uh, but currently it is running in a constant loop. It's actually running at 120 beats per minute. 
Um, now, I know there's probably a bit of a lag and latency issue because of WebEx, uh, but basically it's running every queue every half second because it's running at 120 beats per minute. So uh, you can slow this down. There's several ways to do it. Uh, so the way that I like is if I hold down choose, so I'm going to hold down choose on master two. And then if you look at the first encoder wheel, it actually says playback rate. So I can scale that down to a value of my liking. So we'll do 30. So now that chase is running much, much slower, essentially. Um, so now this chase is running. Uh, you can also control it on the fader. We're going to talk about how to do that when we talk about batches in the future video, but you can also put the speed of the uh, chase on a fader really easily. You could also go into your options and then you can specify an exact playback rate here as well. Uh, so one of my favorite things though is the direction. So the direction is how it approaches this cue list. So uh, what you could do here is instead of it being up, uh, which sounds kind of funny, because if you look at it, it actually goes down, uh, but it's going up in numbers, uh, is it's going in one constant direction uh, forward, going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You can also make it go, say, down. So now it's going to go the opposite direction. So three, two, one, three, two, one. Uh, you could also do a bounce. So it's going to go one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one. Uh, so that's kind of handy for a couple of different functions if you want to go back and forth between different uh, cues. And then my favorite, which is actually random. So basically, it's just going to go between a different uh, place on stage, essentially. What's nice about this as well is I can just add things really easily to my chase. So if I took my fixtures, I'll close this window out, one through nine at full, put it in a whole new position, uh, do the keys and magenta. Once again, my chase stopped because programmer always has higher priority than playback. So I have information in my program where it's overriding all the information in my, in my um, playback. So I'll hit record, put that onto a master, and I'll put it on the drummer, the green, record, put that onto my master, press clear. And now this chase has basically kind of already been updated. Now we're going to bounce between these five cues once again in a random order. So it might look really ugly, but it's really the, the, the concept that's important to talk about here. Oops. There you go. Excellent. Zoom down on the capture. Josh uh, is asking. Oh, sorry. Are, are we good? Josh is asking if we can add a chase in the middle of a larger queue list, or is that something that you could we you would use a macro to trigger? Personally, that is something I would use a macro to trigger. Um, the queue list do have this option called a link list, uh, uh, called a link queue that allow you to interrupt the flow, and you could turn that into a chase also. Um, I personally don't like doing that very often. I would much rather just have it on a on a separate queue list that I can trigger whenever I want to at that point. Um, and I think Noah is very similar. Yeah, I I would use like a macro. So like if I wanted to trigger this chase throughout multiple points at another queue list, so I'll take Megan your uh, color bar queue list that you had earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do what's called a macro. So uh, this queue list that I created, this ugly uh, solo spot list, is list thirteen. I know it's list thirteen because of this number right here. It says it's queue list thirteen. So I can create a macro, uh, make sure that y'all can see the right-hand screen here, uh, that say in this queue, I would like to go queue list one, three, enter. And then we'll say for this one, I want to uh, release list 13, enter. So now I'm gonna release all my stuff. And all I will press play for queue one. Queue one happens. Make sure you guys can see it. And press play. And now it is essentially by pressing play in one queue list, I've actually started the chase uh, from that queue list. And this is going to run until it receives a command otherwise. So I press play in Q3. My LED bar has changed once again, but my chase is still running. I press play on Q4 and it sends that command to release 
the list number 13. Um, so I used this recently, uh, but recently like a year ago uh, for uh, a theater show I did where there was a, a bunch of folks sitting around a, um, uh, an oil drum, I think what it was called. Uh, and inside the oil drum was basically like a fire. And so I made a chase that was in a randomized order uh, that was just different intensity levels of essentially Christmas lights uh, in a little can. And then uh, I didn't have a whole lot of time to make a whole bunch of cues. So I only recorded like four or five cues, threw it into a chase, called it what it was. And then I came back later and I kind of made more intricate cues uh, for that chase. And then because I just included macros to start and stop it throughout uh, my cue list, I didn't have to update all those cues for that look. I didn't have to update them all to be more intricate. I just had them all kind of reference. So it's almost like the the chase was like almost like a palette, essentially. It's just a simple reference point. Uh, and then if I didn't need the chase to happen, I could just remove that uh, or just move that uh, go queue or move the release queue around. Um, we're getting asked to explain how links are created. Um, sure, I can walk through real quick. So you go to the queue where you want the interruption to happen. So if I wanted to put a link from Q in just working in this one Q list here, from when I hit go after Q1, I want it to go to Q3, like I want to skip Q2, for example. So I go to Q1 first. And then I hit insert link. And that's going to put in a Q, the link queue right after Q1. Um, your fade time is where in that queue list do you want to go to? And then your delay time is how long do you want this to happen? Um, if you're doing like a queue, if you're doing a chase inside your inside your queues, then you would actually put your link queue at the very end of that chase and specify that the fade time is the first queue in your chase. Um, usually, I only use link queues to break at to skip queues. Um, since I rely on tr on tracking, I don't like deleting cues out of my out of my show. If the direct if the designer or the director decides, hey, we are no longer doing this scene, um, then I can just skip over that set of cues. Or or the band is like, hey, we're no longer doing this act or the song. Again, if I'm just working from one cue list, I can just skip over that set of cues with my link. Um, but like if, like I said, I want to go from Q1 to Q3 at this point. I can click where it says Q1. I've been three hit enter now when noah hits go hits go it's going to go to q3 and it jumps that way um i'm not the biggest fan of link queues i just i i like the comment macro section i like the comment macro stuff a lot better for making chases in my queues it gives me a little bit more uh more um flexibility on what i want to do Uh, if you are doing this as a chase, there's a couple options here under the delay where instead of forever, so it's just going to keep looping that forever, you can say how many times do you want to do this loop? Do I want to do it for like 10 times, 5 times, 2 times, that kind of deal? Um, or you can say timed. I want to do it for 3 seconds. Well, great. So then it'll try to go for 3 seconds. Um, once 3 seconds is hit, it'll the next time it hits that link, it'll break out from your queue. Um, it has to hit it once. Yeah. So I'll actually, I'll do a, we'll do a 10 second. So yeah, and make sure you put a wait time on that link. Very good. I'm just getting something. I got you. Oh, and I can also say go back to Q1. There you go. Now it's done, right? So basically, what this is saying is after 10 seconds of looping throughout this link. Uh, go ahead and proceed on to the next queue. So mm -hmm. give it a second, second, and there you go. So now it's ready. I put a follow on to four. It would have actually just assumed on to go on to four. Um, if you want to see how, how links are used a bit more in busking or live event stuff, then tune into tomorrow's um, webinar that we're doing that Mark Lorenz and Jonathan Armstrong are doing so that they and they're going to go over their busking setup and they'll show a bit more of how links are used. Um, I just don't use them too often because whenever I need them, it's mainly to build a chase. And like I said, I like that being in a separate queue list 
because at this point, without copying those cues, I can't use those, this chase over again. Um, and I'd like to do, to do the, I made it once, now I just want to reuse this over and over again method. Yeah, I I prefer chases as well. There's uh, there's a couple times I've definitely used links, but I just mm -hmm. I tend to prefer chases. The only time that I need a link is when I need it to after an amount of time move on. So that's where I would use a link in this case. Uh, but that's just how that's just how my brain works. I think Megan, you and I are kind of similar in that regard. Yeah, I'd stay away from links altogether. I don't I don't I would just do a follow queue on my release queue. For my comment macro um because if my 10 seconds ends up up here and my actors keep going on then my board up has to then break out to q4 himself that, that's my only reason um cool and with that being said we should talk a little bit about the list directory um just pointing where they are because i said that you can delete masters and that's not actually deleting the list earlier so let's go ahead and clear out our lists on our list on our faders again. So hold down delete, hit choose on all our faders, and that's going to clear out the our masters. Yay, our grandmaster came back because we had recorded over it. Um, so this didn't actually delete the list from the show. That just again removed the reference on the playback master. So to open the list directory, you can either double tap list or hit list from this wonderful window. And here are your queue list directory. So from the queue list directory, usually guard is turned on by default. Um, so you can, so with guard turned on to move things back to the fader, you just click on the list you want, hit move, the actual move button, and then tap choose on the fader that you want it to move on to, that you want the list to move to. Um, and you could just keep doing that exactly in that order and get all the lists down there if you wanted to. You can also use your command line to so list the number, move, and then choose the fader you want it to go to would also work. Um, now I said guard was turned on. And if you notice that when guard turned on, when Noah clicks on a list, it's actually just putting that list inside the command line. Um, so it just puts that name in the command line so you can actually just utilize it, utilize the object through the command line. Um, now, if you wanted to, like you can actually if you turn off the guard you can say um if now if you turn off guard you can actually start playing the list themselves so like if noah pushes the button on list one the lights will come on if the fader is up for list one which it wasn't um right. because it's on a fader it's going to listen to that fader's value mm -hmm. Now, what it, what is kind of cool is if you accidentally deleted the list from the fader without the intensity being up, like the fader being up, when you press down on the queue list in the queue list directory, your encoder wheel should have intensity on the last one that you can actually go and adjust. So your last encoder wheel should be intensity by default. So you can go and bring that up if you need to to bring up that full. Um, Cool, and that's how you, and so you can go fader, go lists from the queue list directory just by tapping on them or clicking on them. If you wanted to release lists at this point, you can um, click and hold on the list first and then press release at the same time. So it's just the list and then a list, hold the list and then hit release. Um, and that's usually why, and that's how you can manipulate lists by moving them back to the faders, deleting them off the faders, um, and that kind of stuff. If you have lists that are in the faders, that are in the queue list directory and not on faders, you can actually trigger those via comment macros also. Um, so that one that with the color bar that we made earlier that triggers that um, movement chase that Noah made, if we just had that color uh, color bump one, going we could trigger that list with the chase without it being on the on the faders um so i do this often to clean up my playback bars so my chases just aren't on on my faders if i don't need them to be uh, this is the one we talked about marking we'll do list 11 i, I think it was like list 11 maybe that's why i should label things yeah labeling is nice oh, i also i removed i removed those comment macros yep we it's fine i was just saying because we had done it before um cool 
And I mean, that's how the queue list directory can be moved. If you have any specific questions about the list directory, definitely throw them out there. Oh, I didn't talk about actually deleting a list from a show. Uh, maybe you no longer want list number nine to be in your show at all. You can either, with guard turned on, click on the list in the list directory and then hit delete, or hit list the number you want, so list nine, and then delete. And that'll ask you if you want to delete list nine. List nine. List nine, delete. There you go. Yep. And then window pops up. I'll press enter, and it's gone. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's kind of it's a bad habit of mine to uh record something, realize I don't need it or I don't like it, and then I'll just delete it off my master, and then I come back a few days later and I'm like, why do I have all these queue lists? So you have to kind of remember if you really want to get rid of it, type in the list and delete it. Delete it. Mm -hmm. I very rarely actually delete the list from my list directory because I'm like, whatever. I only usually play what's on my fingers. You might need it later. Exactly. Because I go, oh, I don't need this right now. Let's delete it. And then 30 minutes later, I'm like, oh, actually, I did need that, Chase. Um, let's see some of these options. If you name the list, uh, list five, Carl, can you call it up as Carl? Or do you need to know the number? You need to know the number to call it. Um, so you would say list five, delete, or list five, move. You can't call it by the name that you have, that you're by the label inside the list directory. Um, looks like there's kind of been a questions here. Uh, we are, I think, Megan, I know we had a couple more things we wanted to talk about. I think we can squeeze them into the next video because it's not going to be as long as this one. So I think yeah, we, we definitely can because they apply to scenes also. Yeah, they, yeah, which is why we put them at the end. Mm -hmm. So right, let's take a look at a couple of these questions. So we'll move on to the Q&A here and we'll just try to answer what we can. Um, Um, there is one here that Robin had, uh, I wish to control intensity on a whole set of fixtures by assigning them all to one master or fader, as I can't afford the real estate to give each a dedicated handle. Um, whether the VMs, virtual masters are toggled on or off is irrelevant. So when the guitarist goes to yell at his tech, I can toggle the unit off. Um, you can make what's called an HTP fader for those specific fader, for those, um, you would make a list and make that an HTP list. IS takes precedent, so when, then that can control your intensity with that, with that list. Uh, uh, H HTP lists do not get really, or the intensity part of an HTP queue list does not get released at all. So you actually have to, the only way you can get around that is to move your fader down. But that, that's how I would get around that is with the um, HTP faders. Yeah, there's cool. two, I'm going to bounce off of you just a little bit. Yeah, go for it. This is, a, this is a very common thing that I get um, in as, as a class question and, you know, conferences and stuff like that. So one through nine at full, that's all the information I programmer. I'm going to record that onto 10. Uh, and then once again, I'm going to make sure I still have that in my programmer. So forward and put that on nine. So I'm going to do two different things here. So I'm going to press clear. Both of these lists should do the exact same thing. They're both intensity at full. This Q list 14 here, I'm going to open it up, go into my options, and I'm going to say use HTP, use highest takes precedence. This Q list 15 here, I'm going to go into my options and do something different. I'm going to go to my standard tab. This is where I get to assign what my different uh, buttons in my master do. I say go off zero and release at zero. So there's two kind of ways to achieve this. There's actually, there's another way to, um, I'll do that as well. You can also make what's called a group uh, inhibitive master. So this is actually done from a group directory. So let's say all solo spots move to, and I'll put that on number nine. So I've got a lot of things happening here right now. So uh, the first one, the more common one is this HTP fader. So essentially how that works is if the fader is up, so I'm just moving the fader up, I'll go ahead and switch so you can see all of this here. Uh, if the fader here is up, 
it brings up the intensity. Uh, it uh, just basically brings it up uh, just like you would expect it to. However, if I release, it's not going to release. So I'm trying to release it. I hold pig, you know, which is a very common thing. Pig release doesn't release. Okay, so that's something to do keep in mind that HTTP faders do not release their intensity. Uh, so that's one way to sort of put intensity on a fader, on a handle, essentially. The other way, so I'm going to push that down, is to uh, do this method here. So on this QLIS 15 on master 9, I did that uh, go off 0 and release that 0. So it means that if my fader is going off of 0, it goes that list. If I push it down to 0, it releases that list. So once again, very similar behavior. However, the difference is that if I release this, it can release. So depending on if you want it to release or not release, whenever you specify a release command, it's kind of up to you if you use either one of those methods. You have an inhibitive master. Uh, so an inhibitive master works subtractively versus additively. So if this HTTP fader here, this 10th fader is additive, I'm adding in intensities. Uh, the inhibitive master on number eight here, which is actually that group, is subtractive. So I have to have my fixtures add a value first, and then I can inhibit those values by pulling the fader down. So some people actually have all their fixtures at full by default and then just inhibit from there. So there's a couple of different ways depending on how your brain works, uh, but those are the three pretty common ways when it comes to taking functions and putting them on faders. So that was kind of a long example, but hopefully that kind of explains different methodologies that I see. So Robin says, so a different way to phrase this, can intensity of a series of lists be controlled from a single master? Yes, that's uh, called a batch, uh, which we're going to talk about two videos from now. But essentially, you can take multiple uh, queue lists and put them into one place. So I'm going to say list one through eight move, and I'll put it on to master seven. And so now, on master seven, I've created a batch number one. And this would essentially control the intensity of those cumulus. If you look virtually on uh, cumulus one and two, which are also on master one and two, I am actually controlling their intensity, this little blue bar here, from a different place from what is essentially on that batch. So if you wanted to bring down intensity for a bunch of stuff or bring up intensity for a bunch of cumulus or scenes, you could do what's called a batch. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We have a whole video just on batches. I think that's three videos from now because the next one seems the next one's effects yeah. and then batches yes batches you are, are correct fixed, I think. okay yep, it's batches can't, can't remember yeah. how i planned this out or how i planned this out <laughs> yeah we did scenes effects and then batches which are they all flow nicely together um bud is asking if he has a queue list that is referenced in a macro by a queue list number and he moves the queue list to another place in the queue list directory so it's not a palette it's a directory uh, will it track properly? It does not. Um, so the macro is purely referencing that specific object. It's not actually referencing. It's referencing the object location. It's not referencing the object itself. Um, so it's saying list. So if you have a have a macro that says list one, go list one, and you move list one to list five, it's going to still say go list one, whether or not there's a list there. Um, it, it it just stays the same. I just tried it over here, as uh, to make sure that I was going to say the right thing, and it does it does not track. It'll just keep that reference to list one. Uh, um, here's, here's a good one. Uh, so, can you control one cue list with two faders, one for intensity and one for playback rate? Uh, so, yeah, that's super easy. This cue list thirteen is that chase that we made earlier. You just say list 13, move, put it on to one, and then list 13, move, put it on to two. So now it's controlling. Um, uh, I've got the same object, but in two different masters. 
Uh, and then what I can do, I haven't quite talked about control sets in our series yet, but if you hold down choose, you can switch a control set around. Uh, so basically a little sub window comes up that says uh, standard, uh, switch to this view so you can see it. Uh, but if you hold down here, standard intensity, playback rate, effect rate, effect size. So on this one, it's already standard fader, so I'll leave it like it is. On number two here, I'll switch it to playback rate. So now the first fader is controlling the intensity, and now the second fader is controlling the playback rate. So you can take two items and put them onto um, multiple, uh, multiple masters on multiple pages too as well. Let's say I have, so Arnold's is saying, let's say I have some LED lights on a bump button and I want them to fade out like conventionals. How can I do that where they shift to like red when releasing? Oh my goodness. I actually did this. This was part of a work assignment that I had um, actually in the demo room for a while. Um, so that you can either, so what I ended up doing was I did a 2 QQ list. The first list, turn them on, of course. The sec or the first queue, turn them on. The second queue shifted them to red. And then I had an auto release set as well. Oh, I don't yeah, and then I think I had an auto release set as well. Um on that, so that as soon as Q2 was done, then it would start releasing um, at the same time. So Q1, the lights would come on in whatever color I wanted. Um, Q2, the lights would shift to red and pro and start dimming out intensity, and then Q and then it's auto releasing. So as soon as I'm done going Q3, Q2, it just releases. Um, Noah, can you open up one of the list options real quick so sure. we can show where that auto release option is? We can also walk through an example of that. Um, it was just a little bit fiddly. Underneath options, queue list, there's a action at end of list option. And if you hit that drop down, there's an auto release at end. Um, so that when, once you're done, once that queue, final queue list is done crossfading, it can just go away. It can start releasing. And then you can adjust your release time here. So I could even say, so let's go ahead and can we close this and can we actually try doing the example real quick? Sure. Cool. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna delete those kilos that I recorded. Oh, whatever. I was just gonna have us do it to, to another fader, empty fader, and let's do it with right. 401 through that pool, and record that as Q1. Um, 401 through enter, make it some kind of red, and have it go to um. Go to like, go to zero, at zero, enter. Um, time, time, sorry, intensity, time, time. Do I want my intensity faded? Sure. Um, 0.25, Great. enter. And let's record that as Q2 on that same fader. Cool. Um, and then set that queue list to be that auto release fader or that um, that option that I was talking about, the auto release. release. Yep. And then change your release time to zero seconds. Cool. So now if we. Yeah. So if you go on that list. And then you go again, it should shift to red and then start going out. Uh, that's a very it, rough really way to do it. A very rough way to get that conventional look. It'll it'll just take some timing and some color options with that. Right. And it also depends on the fixtures themselves. Yeah. I think some fixtures actually support doing it. Like there's a mode on the fixtures for you to do it. Um, but if I've done that before because we wanted a very specific look. You could also uh, set your default uh, value for if there if there's a color temperature value on the fixture, you could 
modify it to be more warm. Uh, or you could set a default cyan magenta yellow value to be a bit of red so that as it's fading out, you get that sort of red shift. Uh, just to kind of play with it, it, it really is probably going to depend on the fixture type. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, cool. uh, Noah asks again, uh, what is the shortcut to open up the uh, control set on a master? So you just hold choose on the master. So if you hold down choose on this uh, the bar here, it'll bring up that sub window uh, on the left. So you can't quite see it because of the way the uh, uh, capture software is working. Uh, it brings up a sub window that the, the video capturing software does not uh, take. But essentially, you hold down choose on that master, and then you can switch the control set there. Uh, you can also hold down on the actual master itself uh, if you can do multi touch. Um, there's a question about going over batches again. I'll just briefly explain the syntax and why. And then remember, we're going to go over batches in its own video, basically. Um, but to move, basically, a batch can hold multiple items together. So, one. So if I want to list one through eight to go onto one fader, so that I can hit go when I hit go on all those faders, or I control the intensity all at one time for those for those lists, then it's list one through eight move and then choose the fader that I want to go that I want those that batch to live on and those batches and then it'll make a batch with those lists already in it um, again May 14th we already have a session plan to do batches so if you don't completely understand mark it on your calendar and we'll go over it on May, May 14th and if you can't if you can't make it it'll also be recorded and you'll be able to view it on that YouTube uh, channel as well mm -hmm. Uh, we uh, unfortunately we try to kind of keep our the each video kind of focused on specific topics. Uh, I know a lot of things kind of carry over between different videos, uh, but that because we have a specific video for it, we're going to kind of hold off on that question. Yep. Cool. Um, and to, some a stream that's not mentioned on the on the thing, and we're going to probably start signing off here. Um, is that tomorrow we are doing busking with Mark and Jonathan. Um, you can sign up for that on study hall and um, yeah, on study hall, you should see the link for it. Um, it's going to be a good one. If you can't make it tomorrow, it's the same time, 12 p.m. CDT. If you can't make it, it will also be recorded. If you're trying to find the link as well, if you don't know where the study hall website is, uh, social media. So if you're on like Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, any of those things, go on to either the ETC or the high end systems, preferably the high end systems pages, and you can find links to all of that. Um, I so just put it in the chat. If you just copy that into Google, it should go. It'll make you log into my ETC, but that's the that's the same. It'll it'll get you there. Uh, and then on the slide is uh, me and Megan's next stream of this series that we've been doing. Uh, but as I said, there's a special a special guest uh, webinar tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what Megan's talking about. Yep. Cool. Thanks, well, guys. Any other questions? Give her a couple minutes, give a couple seconds if you have another question. Uh, other than that, we're going to sign off. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. So we're going to hang out for just a few moments, but we'll go ahead and call the webinar over. Yep. Thanks, guys. Again, thanks for stopping by. We'll see y'all again. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.